sermon text will be in Colossians 1, 5. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you heard before in the word of the truth, of the truth of the gospel. Um, I'm going to have a prayer for Brother Bob. Dear Heavenly Father, please bless this brother. I want to pray that you um, bless the words he has to say and um, you guide his heart and mouth, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Yeah. We're going to say it louder in heaven. <laughs> when you get there and you've been here, you'll all testify it's better to be there than here. Yeah, Although this is pretty good. The hope that is declared by the gospel. Well, we give thanks to God. Are you giving thanks to God? Yeah. You're participating in the gospel. And the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. You know, this is still valid. The saints pray for one another, don't they? Yes. Praying always. Well, I, I pray sometimes for you. Well, that doesn't have the same punch, does it? Praying always for you. In other words, God's people, they care about one another. This is the care of the church. Paul, remember, he said he had the care of the church. This is it lived out. I'm praying always for you. What are you praying for? Since we heard of your faith in Christ and the love which you have for all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. You ever think about there's something that's in heaven right now that belongs to you? You've been laying up treasures? See, see, see I noticed I noticed on the Lord's day you was laying up some treasure. Well, it's not going anywhere. See, that's, what, that's, the, that's really what he's saying. He's saying you work for treasures here, they're gone. You've got to leave them behind. But you get up in there where your treasure is. They're all there. Not one of them is missing. The hope that's declared up in the gospel. Where have we heard before the word of truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world and bringing forth fruit? Now, doesn't that sound good? Doesn't that sound good? But when the message goes out, it doesn't fall on idle ground. You say, well, it, it may appear that way. No, someone's in there. We don't mean it. We may not see it. The Holy Spirit knows exactly what he's doing. God doesn't throw seed on the wayside. He, he's, he's doing a work. He's wanting that to grow up in the Christ. Amen. See, God's not going to lose anything. Amen. He's really not going to lose anything. Jesus said, I have lost nothing except the son of perdition. And that's that the scriptures might be fulfilled. So that was for something too, wasn't it? The hope. There's a very real and effectual response that's built into the gospel. So see, we just need to be faithful enough to preach it, to present the gospel, the real, raw gospel. And there's a, there's a response built into that. When, it, when people hear it, they respond. Now, they say, well, I was in the service and the gospel was preached and nobody responds. Yeah, they did. It just wasn't good. But they all responded, didn't they? Everyone has a response, whether they believe or they don't believe. It wasn't the gospel's fault. It was the hearer's fault. I'm speaking now of the gospel. There's a lot of people say they're preaching the gospel, but are they preaching the gospel? This gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ always produces hope in those who believe it. Always. I just haven't felt so hopeful. Give yourself to the gospel again. Hear it again, because it's the good news. It's good news. You know, you were dead in trespasses and sins. You were dead. You had no relationship with God. You could not come up into the presence of God. You were unholy. You were unrighteous. But Jesus, he is holy. 
and he is righteous. So he says, I'll take your place so you can take mine. In other words, you can come unto God spotless, without sin or any such thing, and he will receive you. Why? Because he rejected Christ. Why? Because he took your sin and now you get the righteousness of God when you believe the gospel. Good news. We have good news today. We don't have to sin. We don't. There's, not, there's no, nothing out there that can make you sin. All you got to do is just resist the devil. You say, well, that sounds awfully simple. You ever tried it? Resist the devil. It'll take everything you got. But when you do it, it's effective. Be quiet, because Jesus is at the right hand of God. The gospel is so effective, it makes you that you'll be able to stand before a holy and a righteous God accepted in the beloved. Now that's, see, the, the, what, the, what, what's the gospel then? It's the declaration of that. Jesus did it all. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you can stand before God and be absolutely righteous? Well, the gospel's done something to you, right? It's done something to you. It's given you a confidence that even though I couldn't do it by the works of the flesh, by Jesus' work, by one act of obedience, he has saved forever all them that believe. But like I said, that's the real gospel. But what if the gospel you've been hearing sounds like this? Don't worry. God's done all the work in salvation. You just have a good time and let God worry about that religious stuff. Does that bring you any hope? Does that even sound good? Like it's okay. It's all right. God's got it. You, I know you've heard stuff like this. How about this? There isn't anything that you can do to make God love you anymore. Oh, that sounds like somebody's been thinking, but they just been, th been thinking high enough. I mean, somebody put some kind of thought in that. It just wasn't the right thought. These are real things I'm talking about. How about this? God loves you just the way you are. Or how about this? God loves you just as much as he loves Jesus. Now, see, these, these all may have an element you know, like the word love is in there. May have an element of truth. The problem is, is they're not true. But this is being held out as the gospel. How about this? God loves everyone the same. He loves Judas just as much as he loves Peter. Now, is that the truth? It's not the truth, is it? So see, when people preach this and they say, I preach the gospel, I don't understand why they didn't believe. Or we can tell them, we know why. We know why, because that's not the gospel. Before these corrupt doctrines could ever be effective and be presented to any serious saint, their understanding of the love of God had to be corrupted. And we're living in a time when the love of God's been corrupted. The doctrine of the love of Christ has been corrupted. And they don't realize that you start talking about love independent of Jesus, it, it doesn't matter what you say after that. It's just not going to be effective. The love of Christ constraineth us. See, it's, it's, not, it's not like God loves you independent from Christ. That's impossible. Amen. Well, you get into Christ and the love of God will shine upon you. Amen. Amen. What, what is that? That's some of that hope that's built into the gospel. See, we can't take the gospel apart and choose which part of it we want to talk about. And say, well, you know, that other stuff, that, that makes people feel bad. We just won't talk about the stuff that makes people feel bad. Well, you're not going to save anybody either. See, we got to realize where we're at before the love of God means anything. Before the good news is good news, you got to hear the bad news, right? Why each of these teachings may appear to have a small fragment of truth, we must be able to judge their hope factor. In other words, what, when you hear somebody talk, do they make you hope for what God's offering? Do you really, really have an inner desire? I want to know Christ. 
more than I know anybody else. What, it, what creates that? The preaching of the gospel. You tell people what God did in Christ for you, and it will create hope for everyone who believes it. See, Eve would have never eaten of that fruit had her concept of God not been altered. What did Lucifer do? He came in and he, he, he modified her understanding of God. And then she did whatever he asked her to do. Because she didn't really understand anymore. He messed with her understanding. And any doctrine that messes with your understanding of the gospel is dangerous. See, there's the much more factor. Is, is the gospel you're preaching provoking men to want much more? I, I want to hear more of that. Yeah. Remember when Paul spoke on Mars Hill? Some of them rejected him, but some of, some of them, they went to him right after and said, we want to hear some more. We want to hear some more of that. Well, I asked God, you know, I want to hear more. And look at God supplied so much more today, isn't he? So much more. We need more. See, we haven't arrived yet, brother, and I know you know this, but I remind myself of that. I, you haven't arrived yet. It may be good, but it's not as good as it's going to be. God's got so much more for us, brother. Hope is a, an anchor. Hope will teach you that God is faithful. You're, you're, you're hoping in Christ? You're hoping that um, on that day you move into the inheritance? Some believe in the gospel and they begin a lifelong walk of faith with the, with the, with the Christ, the Son of the living God. See, this, this hope provokes you to alter who you are. Now, now see, he lays out for you, he has exceeding great and precious promises that do this, right? These promises are exceeding great and precious because they're there. The fulfillment of them is there. We get a first fruit of salvation now, but that's all we got. I mean, you, you're, you got a new spirit living in you, right? You have, you have the new nature of God living in you, but you got this old frail body that tries to drag you down, tries to misrepresent everything you hear but see, he gives us something to allure us. It allures through faith. It will allure you to cast off the works of darkness, right? Lay hold on eternal life. Why? Because if you don't, you're going to be damned. That's why. We're not in a state of, of, of perfection yet. We're in a state of flux. We got a body that would very, very quickly lead us off to do things that you think, well, I would never think of that. Your body would. So what do you got to do? You got to be compelled, allow the exceeding great and precious promises of God to allure you through hope, through your faith, to look up, look away from these other things. They're moved. You're, are you moved by hope? Has hope moved you? Say, well, what do I have to be moved from? You have to be moved to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. They're there. They're very real. So this isn't like a, like a, just a lesson. This isn't just like some theoretical thoughts we're kicking around here today. This is real. This is life or death. Remember, he stood before me, said, I give you today life or death. Choose life. What, what, what's going to do that for us? The gospel. It creates a desire to live with God more than it is to please yourself now. It works, in other words. The gospel works. The proclamation of the gospel produces an environment wherein the promises of God are possible. You say, well, I heard about them promises, but that's like pie in the sky, right? No, right now you're tasting of the powers of the world to come. How? You believe. You're believing what God promised. And so you're tasting of a little bit of it. 
a taste of it, enough to make you want more and more and more. And that's what hope is. It gives you more and more. You say, well, I've been hoping for years, but there's a lot more to hope for. God's promises are big, big promises, exceeding great and precious. Of course, you know, can God do less? You see, this is, this is for God, this is like, I'm just showing them who I am. I'm just revealing a little bit of who I am. And anyone who wants it can have it. Do you want it? Just as the power was conveyed to the man to take up his bed and walk, at the words of Jesus, everyone who hears the gospel and hears it will receive strength to believe it. See, a lot of people are hearing the words, but they just don't hear. There is a hearing that God has to command. Let them hear. I say, I can say that all day long and you won't hear. But when God says it, everyone that he says it to hears. Now you just have to look it up in the scriptures. It's there. How about Job? Job, he's living in the starlight age. Talking about starlight age. Job, somebody read somewhere that Job and Abraham were contemporaries. Now that's a starlight age there, brethren. And you say, well, well, I know we, we have this opportunity to, to, to know about the hope of the resurrection. Well, this is like common to us. You say, but this is just for us. Well, Job would have to stand up and say, I disagree. This is what Job said. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. Now, see, you got to put this in context of where Job's living. He's living in a time before there was any revelation about Jesus. We all have experience living in this world without Christ. Remember back before you were enlightened? Did you know about the resurrection of the dead? We can testify that it was a life without life. A person that's not in Christ, they don't have any life. Actually, they're experiencing the pains of death over and over every day. Talk about monotony and vanity. Solomon had it right. Vanity of vanities. Vexation of spirit. You live in a world without hope and it's almost not worth living. You take Christ out of the picture and none of us would have a reason to live. See, there's just no reason for it. But see, in, in that, in the context of that, this is God's world. And before any revelation, I mean detailed revelation about what Jesus was going to accomplish, what salvation was really going to be like, Job said this, And also, now, behold, my witness is in heaven. My record is on high. For I know that my Redeemer liveth. Job said that back in the twilight age. So see, the question is, is whether or not we're close to God, because when you get close to God, when you start seeing anything about God, some things become crystal clear. And Job said, and he shall stand on the latter day upon the earth. Now see, do we have any, any revelation where anybody said that before Job said that? Where they said, oh, God's going to come and visit the earth and, and he's going to stand here and I'm going to raise from the dead. That's what he's going to say next. And though after my skin worms eat and destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. <laughs> oh, I tell you. Now remember, we're talking about an ancient hope, but this is hope nonetheless. This is hope. He said, with whom I shall see for myself. And mine eyes shall behold and not another, though my reins be consumed within me, I'm going to die and the worms are going to eat me up. But Job said, I have confidence that I'm going to He's going to raise me. I'm going to see him with my own eyes. Now, see, we got to have more than this in Christ to make it. I'm just being truthful with you. This was a great thing that Job saw. This carried him through, right? It carried him through. God gave him to see something that carried him through all this terrible trouble. Well, we've been given to know a lot more than that in Christ Jesus. See, our hope 
even though that was a great hope for the time, our hope's been accentuated by Jesus Christ's resurrection. He's now living in you, the hope of glory, the hope of waking up with his likeness. This kind of hope will keep your soul. It'll keep your soul. And that does need to be kept. We're living in an age where souls, people don't even understand, for the most part, what it even means. You, you have this kind of hope, and God will be provoked to bless you. Look what he did for Job. Now, see, if, you, if you're longing for that day when you rise and you're in Christ's image and you're, you're, part, you're part of, of, of the, the body of Christ, if you're hoping for that, God's going to be provoked to bless you. I want God to be provoked to bless me. I do. And see, the way he's arranged salvation is if you believe and you walk in the spirit. He'll, why are you getting so many blessings? Because God's being provoked. See? We have a man in heaven. We have every reason to be hopeful. We have a man at the right hand of the majesty on high in the heavens, and he's on our side, and he's bringing many sons to glory. We have every reason to hope. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? For the hope. See, Paul seen faith in them. He's seen faith in them. And he says, I'm giving thanks to God for the hope that's laid up for you. Oh, this is good. Amen. Hope is a container in which God's placed a lot of good things. A lot of good things. So you start thinking about hope and about what God's promised in Christ Jesus for those who believe. And you're never going to run out of things to think about. It's just like packed with God. There is a hope. And it is laid up for you already in heaven. Jesus said, if I go away, I'll come again, right? Uh, if I go away, I will come again, right? Well, is he here? Is Jesus presently with us? Well, when he shows up, <laughs> ain't nothing going to be the same. When Jesus shows up and he comes <laughs> and the elements are melting, Nothing's, no, nothing's going to be the same, brother. <laughs> We're going to be caught up with him, right? Now, this is the great hope. Caught up with him in the air, and so shall we ever be with him. We're going to be with him forever. Now, does that interest you? Are you interested in, in being caught up together? Are you interested in being laying this body aside? And taking a, a body which is like unto his glorious body. Are you interested in that? Well, I tell you, they're talking about hope factor. This is a, this, talk, thinking about the resurrection of Christ is, is like, like this big on the hope measure. Why? Because, you, see, it doesn't, only people who love Christ want to think about dying. And we're not talking about morbid thinking about, we're talking about blessed thinking about dying. There's a blessed way to think about dying. You know, we all are going to do it unless Jesus comes back and then we're going to be changed, which is kind of like the same thing, but just not exactly. We're not going to have this body anymore. So everything that happens in death is going to happen to us. It's just, we're not going to, whatever happens right now in the grave, we're going to bypass that. But oh, what a hope factor. You know, I want my sermons to have a hope factor. You know, to where when you get done preaching, people say, I want Jesus more. There is a personal aspect to hope. Can't be avoided. Hope has to be personal to you. It can't be an abstract thing like, oh, I can see the hope in them. Oh, that guy's really hopeful. It, it, that's good. But um, it, that hopefulness has got to get in you for it to have any effect. And that's what preaching does. See, it. It, it, it helps to produce this hope, the transfer of hope. The Holy Spirit can give you hope, good hope, through grace. He can do it. It can give you um, 
to understand that it's Christ who is our hope. That's what the Holy Spirit's doing. You see, through preaching, through the declaration of the gospel, you come to the understanding, my hope is Christ. It's Christ. He's my hope. Right? Amen. And I hope also that those, all these happen during, by, by the proclamation of the gospel. It, it'll teach you that, um, you know what? I'm not ashamed of my hope anymore. I'm not ashamed of it anymore. What happened? The gospel got through. It got through what God's done in Christ Jesus. And you don't care what anybody thinks anymore. I'm going to hope in God. I'm not ashamed of the hope anymore. I'm not ashamed of my hope. Why? The gospel got through to you. That's what happened. It wasn't that I got through to you. The gospel got through to you. What God's done in Christ produces unashamed hope. You ever heard somebody preach the gospel and like right in the middle of the sermon, you realize it's hope that's saving me. I'm saved by hope. Say, well, <laughs> I've actually said this online. Somebody want to argue with me. <laughs> well, it's my belief in the gospel. Yeah. Okay. I go along with that. But it's still the hope that saved me. The gospel was preached, but because I believed it and hoped in it, it saved me. See, you can't divorce hope from salvation. You can't. It's not possible. And then you start realizing and, and, and you start rejoicing in what? In hope. Have you ever just sat back and thought about everything God's going to give us in the world to come and you find yourself rejoicing? You're rejoicing in Christ Jesus. What's happened? The hope caused you to rejoice. Why? Because it's real. See, the things that God's giving us to see in the spirit about the ages to come, the things that he's testified of, it's going to happen. We're going to be with Christ. We're not going to go out anymore. These things, they're real. And that's why they can produce a rejoicing. You're, in other words, you're fully anticipating when you move into your inheritance. Fully, I've been thinking about it. I've been thinking about that inheritance. And you know what? I'm persuaded that it's real. What will start happening, you'll start rejoicing in it. In other words, rejoicing in hope is saying the same thing as blessing God. So you, when you start rejoicing, it means you're fully persuaded. You're rejoicing and God's blessed. You want to bless God? Does anybody want to bless God? Well, you can abound in hope. Now, it's really hard to make someone discouraged if they're abounding in hope, right? If you're just, if you're being exercised, your faith is being exercised, I'm abounding in hope. I just can't wait for Jesus and something happens over me. He's like, okay, I'm abounding in hope. Yeah, I know that happened, but you know what? This is much more better. This is good. I'm abounding in hope. I just can't wait to see Jesus. What happened? The gospel got through to you. Because see, the gospel contains all the good news, all the elements that will manufacture hope in you. What will happen? You'll start becoming hopeful. I mean, I tell you, I like to be around hopeful people. You ever been around the non-so hopeful people? The other ones that say, we're doomed. They say, well, maybe you are, but just go over there. No, I'm serious. I love it. I, I, I love. I do. I love. But there comes a time when you've got to cut off non-productive fellowship. Things that are not profitable. Things that brag you down. Things that you just, I mean, it may be going on, but just don't give it the ear. Hang out with hopeful people. Hopeful. People that are filled with hope. What are we hoping for? The, <laughs> the hope of glory. You ever thought about the hope of glory? The hope of actually being like Jesus? We are going to be glorified together with him, right? All right, I got to wrap this up. Is hope the hope of the gospel now? Is that purifying your soul? Is it like you think about it and, 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 and those desires that you had, they just faded away. Why? Because you 
allowed yourself to be filled with, with hope. I'm hoping in Christ. He's able to help me to deny this, whatever it is. A lot, a lot of the things that come are just ideas anyway. It's thrown in there. See, if you're saturated with hope, that's like, that's, that's, hope is a helmet, right? Right? So it protects the way you think. Hope's useful. All this hope, all we have, the one that protects your mind, purifies your soul, it's a, it, one that's a lively hope. It's alive in you. It's just not like a doctrine you believe. I believe in hope. Well, yeah, the devils believe stuff. But see, is it working in you? Is it alive in you? If it is, it will be useful, beneficial. You'll enable you to do things to cast off and to put on. All of this hope is possible because of what one man accomplished. Every single bit of it. None of your hope is based on what you've done. I mean, if anybody ever tries to tie that, they'll be, they'll be very disappointed with the result. See, I'm, just, I'm, I'm really glad because of what I did. Well, that's going to be like very short-lived. When you start hoping in what he did, there's no end to that kind of hope. When the word was made flesh, hope sprang forth like a healing balm. Look at this one that pleased God, a man that pleased God, and now he's in me, pleasing God. Well, this makes it real, doesn't it? This is what Zacharias said. Turn you to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. I tell you, I'm, I gladly resign to be a prisoner of hope in this context. See, I, it, it's captured my attention. Wow. This is the same hope that reached back and comforted the ancient brethren. The same, the same hope, it just, they didn't have as much of it. They didn't see as much to hope for. Noah and Job and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and, 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 uh, and Nathan and Solomon, all these things, and Samuel, all these, all these personalities that were back there, God gave them to see something. Even though small as it was, it produced a hope in God. But now see, Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And so what's the result of your hope? You'll lay down your life for your brethren. This is what, this is what hope will move you to do now. What shall we say to these things, brethren? And I'll close with this word. Now, the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing why? That you may abound in hope. Yeah. See? <laughs> well, I'm hoping. Well, let's ask, let's, let's ask God to help us to abound in hope. Yeah. To be the kind of people that glorify Christ when we speak. That our hope dominates our, our words. And we're able to, to bless one another. Build each other up in the most holy faith. That ye also are full of goodness. I think this is a blessing for the saints to be hopeful, filled with goodness, and able to admonish one another. So no matter the cost, brethren, no matter what it costs you, never let go of the hope that's declared in the gospel. Amen.